Good evening, everyone. We're going to call this meeting back to order at 6.32 p.m. and we'll have the lovely board clerk, Kathleen, lead us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board members, may I please have a motion and a second that we approve the agenda for May 2nd, 2023 as submitted. So moved. Second. Questions or comments on that? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. So we're gonna be moving into the annual budget hearing portion of our meeting and then this is when I get to read a lot, everyone. So mm -hmm. I apologize in advance. As set by statute, it's now time for holding the 2023-24 annual budget hearing of the Penfield Central School District. My name is Lisa Bonatti Chidzi. I am president of the Penfield Central School District Board of Education. The vote on the budget and for members of the Board of Education is in two weeks and not at this meeting. The polls will be open on Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 in the high school gym from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. The district has continued extended voting hours to make it more convenient for residents to vote. The notice of annual budget vote and election has been duly published according to law in the Daily Record and Rochester Business Journal. Affidavits will be filed with the minutes of the meeting. It is customary, however, to read a summary of the notice and the summary is as follows. Notice is hereby given that the annual vote and election will be held at Penfield High School on Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time wherein qualified voters of the district may vote concerning the election of two members of the Board of Education and two budgetary propositions. The election of two members to the Board of Education, Krista Khan and I currently hold these seats. The candidates running to fill these seats in ballot order are Krista Khan, Aliyah L. Amin Turner and Dana Marr. The propositions will be further detailed during the budget summary presentation. We have available complete notice of annual meeting, budget, vote, and election as printed in the Daily Record and Rochester Business Journal, and we'll be pleased to hand any out if someone wishes to see it. At this time, we're gonna have um, Dr. Putnam and Dr. Driffle review some budget information. Great, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Driffle. So uh, this evening um, for our 2023-24 uh, budget hearing, uh, I'm gonna start us off and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffle to dig into the, the heart of the matter. Um, I wanna call, oh wait. Great, if the budget passes, can we buy a new one of these that I don't have to turn on? Okay, <laughs> great. No, sorry, that was user error. So uh, the presentation uh, really is a process of, we'll do a budget development process, and uh, Dr. Driffle will be talking about the proposed 2023-2024 expenditures, as well as the projected 2023-2024 revenues, and then more information on the May 16th voting information. So the budget development process um, is really starts, if you've been tuning into our board meetings um, and, and watching online, uh, really way back in October of uh, 2022 is when the board sets the budget calendar, which breaks out the entire timeline for development of our budget process. And then if you read down the left-hand side, it's the reserve planning, goals and guidelines and factors, budget requests all the way through the first draft of the budget, second draft of the budget, and then the proposed budget and legal requirements is where we are right now going over um, our budget process here in the hearing. And so we, it brings all of that starting October leads us to the annual budget vote, which this year is May 16th. Uh, the budget development process really focuses on the district working with the Board of Education uh, to determine goals and guidelines. What really guides our process in building a budget uh, for the district and making sure it aligns with uh, the vision of the Board of Education and our community. And so our focus has always been academic achievement. Uh, we are a strong academic school district, something we are always proud of, and making sure that our budget uh, includes equitable opportunities across our district college and career readiness, program excellence, 
uh, class size and appropriate staffing, professional learning for all of our staff, and then also partnerships. Um, how do we partner with families, with BOCES, community agencies, and contractual commitments? And then our district, uh, thanks to our Board of Education over many years, is always focused on fiscal responsibility. So really that long range planning and efficiency and operations. How can we save money and still do um, what we do? So the why of what we do, a couple of things. These are just a couple of pieces that at the end of the day, the budget's <laughs> important because it supports so much of, of what the school districts put out across, across New York State. Um, for us, Penfield High School was named uh, 2022, the U.S. News and News Report, as um, a list of the best high schools in America. Bay Trail was named a national school to watch. Uh, our Penfield Elementary Schools um, have been named among the top schools in the area by Buffalo Business First based on four years of test scores. And Penfield School District as a whole was named um, to the 2023 list of best communities for music education. I would point out too, um, the prestige that hits mailboxes this week um, really goes through lots of other student achievement and really focusing on that return of investment. Uh, being that the school district is also a recipient of the 2023 School Safety Excellence Award, titanium level, and uh, so many of our students um, winning awards and uh, being on award-winning teams, both academic and athletic. So that whole student focus, we are a school, we wanna make sure that our budget is focused on that academic achievement, that we support students reaching their full potential when it comes to uh, grades and testing, um, but we also wanna make sure that we are focused on that whole student aspect. So just some examples more listed in your prestige that you'll receive. Uh, but music, 77 students um, this past school year were selected for all county festivals, seven for the all state conference. Our robotics team, uh, impact award and excellence in engineering awards at the regional competition, and they qualified for world championships in Houston, an absolute amazing uh, feat that our robotics team did with lots of hours of work. Our DECA team, multiple awards at state competition and two students qualified for the international competition. And then athletics, we're always proud patriots and our boys basketball team won the Thomas Emanuel Sportsmanship Award, cheerleading, uh, primetime ball sportsmanship award and all PHS teams um, won the primetime community service award. So again, just, um, that focus at our budget is not just to make sure academics are always a priority, but it's that whole student focus to make sure that we're um, developing well-rounded students to enter the college and careers in the workplace after school. So the budget development process, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, when Dr. Driffel uh, steps in here, but want to make sure that in this process, one of the pieces is really around special education services. And this budget supports an expansion of our continuum of special ed services K-12, so we can make sure we're offering uh, the most appropriate education for all students, in this case, especially our students with disabilities. So this budget includes funding for new teachers to provide integrated co-teaching, also called ICOT, at classrooms K-5. to We have this program for students with disabilities and gen ed students at the high school and the middle school, and this expands it to our K-5 schools as well, which again allows students to be in um, the best appropriate class to support their needs. It also allows with ICOT students to be educated alongside general education peers. So it really is, when we talk about inclusion, and this budget focuses on that, is making sure that our students with disabilities and our general education students, at the end of the day, are all students. And we wanna make sure that we support them um, through their own uh, growth to uh, succeed at the highest levels possible. Uh, the other piece was a long conversation is this budget includes the support of an additional um, administrative position at each of our four elementary schools. So we will be adding assistant principals um, to each uh, elementary school. There are many schools that have assistant principals around our area. Um, Penfield has not ever had this at the elementary position. We have talked about it uh, district uh, in, internally in the district with the board for the last couple of years. We've looked at things um, and looked at whether it should be a, a teacher on special assignment, a support person, and ultimately landed in listening to staff 
staff and families, students, of having an assistant principal at each one of those schools. And they will be able to assist with um, teacher observations, building support, and family communications. These positions, we're working right now to make them 11-month positions. So uh, the assistant principals at our elementary schools would not be a 12-month. They wouldn't work all summer. Um, again, trying to be fiscally responsible, but also support the needs of our buildings. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Driffle, I believe, on the fun question of, Dr. Driffle, where does the money go? Yeah, <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Tauben. It goes in a, a lot of places, um, right. so we'll review where all of the dollars go um, in our proposed budget for next year. Before we dive into that, I always take this opportunity at this uh, budget hearing to just take a higher level view of the district's finances. Um, two of the metrics that we look at for this are our credit rating. Um, we are at an AA2 rating, which means high quality, low risk. Um, the report that Moody's issued around this time last year indicated that Penfield Central is in a strong financial position and that we have low fixed costs. That AA2 rating is a stronger rating than the median school district um, in New York State. Another metric that we look at is the Office of the State Comptroller, OSC, Fiscal Stress Monitoring System. As a refresher, this is a system that the state put into place about 10 years ago. Um, it's not only just for schools, but for all uh, local governments, uh, municipalities in New York State, so towns, villages, counties, et cetera. It looks at items like fund balance, cash flow, liquidity, uh, and financial results, operating results. It also looks at environmental information. So for schools, what's that uh, mean? It means uh, change in the taxable value of the community, um, budget vote support percentages, staff turnover, um, things like that to determine if there's any sort of um, risk inherent to, to the organization. We here at Penfield have had no designations since the inception of that program. The three designations they have are susceptible to fiscal stress, in moderate fiscal stress, and in severe fiscal stress. So. Um, Good news on those two fronts. The other uh, high level trend I want to point out because it really drives all of the spending and where the money goes is our projected enrollment, um, how many kiddos we're looking to serve. So this current 22-23 year where we had um, on beds day back in October, 4,630 students. Uh, next year we're projecting just about the same amount, 4622. Uh, and you can see we've really kind of corrected back to the 2019-2020 levels um, in 2020-21 and 21-22. Um, we, you know, we had to deal with the restrictions imposed uh, dealing with the pandemic. Uh, you can see we've kind of recovered this year as we've returned to more of a, a steady state of, of school operations. Um, these numbers are returning to kind of the high levels they were before the Great Recession, kind of in that 07-08 when we were uh, approaching 5,000 kids or so. That was kind of like the all-time high that we had. Um, so the highest number of kiddos that we've had in, you know, 15 years or so. And that is projected to stay relatively stable over the next five years. So uh, I know we've talked a lot about it over the last couple months, like Dr. Putnam mentioned, but here is the final proposed budget uh, in the two parts that we have to submit to the state, the function and the object. I'm going to go through the different functional uh, domains in a little bit more detail on the next slide, but I'll talk about object a little bit. Um, so wages is the biggest cost driver in this budget. Uh, education remains a people business. Most of the dollars associated uh, with our budget go towards staff and faculty. Uh, so that's a $3 million increase year over year, or just under 6%. Uh, the big contractual driver this year is our utility costs. Um, so $600,000 in contractual increase, or 8%. Um, BOCES, which we discussed that, you know, at our March meeting, uh, those materials are available online if anybody's interested in diving into the specific BOCES budget. Uh, but the big driver on that $1.3 million in BOCES spending was uh, special education services, so about a million dollars uh, for that. Equipment and materials, um, just kind of like an inflationary increase there, that's 7.31% increase. Uh, debt service, so that's all of our uh, debt service payments, both principal and interest on old borrowing. Uh, projected to increase next year a little under half a million dollars, but that's in accordance with our debt service schedule. And as we begin to talk about revenues and where the money comes from, we'll show that that is more than offset by the state building aid that we receive uh, to pay that debt. Employee benefits uh, scheduled to increase a little over $2 million for next year, or 7.3%. The big driver on employee benefits this year is health care. Um, the other benefits that we have, uh, contributions to the employee's retirement system, the teacher's retirement system, workers' compensation premiums, 
Um, dental insurance, those things all stayed relatively stable this year. Uh, the big driver was health insurance. Um, the only other factor there was FICA, so the payroll taxes that we have to pay on behalf of our employees, Social Security and Medicare taxes. Um, those two pieces make up about that $2 million increase. And then interfund transfers. Interfund transfers um, means that the general fund has to spend money to the uh, food service fund, the C fund, and the special aid fund, the F fund. Uh, for two specific reasons. One, to go to the cafeteria fund, it's around the meal shaming legislation that went into effect a couple years ago. And then for the special aid fund, interfund transfer, that covers the summer school 4408 program, the students with disabilities over the summer. Uh, that's an 80-20 cost share with the state and our, um, our share is around $180,000 for that program. So $7.7 .7 million or 7.12%. So let's dive kind of deeper into those functional uh, domains. Uh, so function 10, uh, which is the Board of Education. As a reminder, Board of Education members are volunteers. Uh, they do not get paid. Thank you all very much for your service and for those interested in um, running for the board this year. The costs listed here are uh, requirements of the Board of Education to do their business. So it's um, cost for the election officials on voting day, policy services, training for the board members, materials and supplies, production of these meetings, um, payment for the district clerk, uh, all of those kind of items. Central office relates to the superintendent's office, the business office, and the human resources office. Uh, this also relates to the professional services that we're required to carry around um, auditors and legal fees. Um, kind of status quo this year, really no changes of, of note uh, there. Um, central services primarily relates to our buildings and grounds um, folks. The big drivers there are just uh, you know, staff salary increases and in those utilities, as I mentioned before. Special items relates to the BOCES administration costs that we have to um, carry as a district and also district insurance uh, that we're required to carry. Uh, those items are increasing um, $444,000 next year or 6.43%, or no, excuse me, $30,000 or 2.5%. School administration relates to all of the instructional administration uh, that we have in the district. So that's Dr. Maloney's office, that's Dr. Potter's office. It's also all of the main offices that are six school buildings, so all the principals and the staff that work in those offices, all of their associated materials, supplies, training, um, items like that. This includes those four new um, assistant principal positions, uh, so that is scheduled to increase about $350,000 for next year. The Function 21, teaching school, relates to all of the general ed instruction, uh, classroom instruction that we have here in the district, so that is just the common branch uh, classes, but also all of our specials, arts, music, uh, physical education, so on and so forth. A big increase there, 4.2%, $1.2 million uh, year over year. Special programs includes the special education program. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, between the ICOT inclusion that Dr. Putton mentioned and the BOCES um, programs uh, for next year, it's about a $2 million increase. This does also contain our occupational education program uh, for 11th and 12th graders, uh, kiddos that you know have those opportunities over at BOCES with automotive tech or, or nursing, those kind of things. Um, so that's a, a big cost driver next year, uh, just over $2 million or 12%. Instructional media is our libraries and our technology program, only a uh, $70,000 increase this year, 1.5%. That's a slower acceleration of costs than we've had in the last couple of years if we've ramped up our one-to-one -one program kind of in the wake of the pandemic. Now that we're into more of a steady state there, uh, the year-over-year -year increases um, should slow down a little bit. Pupil services, as uh, Dr. Putnam mentioned, has been a big focus of investment for the district. So this includes everything related to uh, the counseling offices, um, psychologists, nursing, uh, social workers, um, this also is our clubs and athletics. Um, so new staff here, a new psychologist here, new investments in the athletic program, um, maintaining all other, our, other of our current programs there as well. Uh, transportation was discussed in detail back at our February meeting. Um, not a lot of change in terms of um, what we're able to do over there. The big cost increase was on fuel and then just uh, staff um, salary increases. So about $300,000 there, 6% relative year over year. Registration office, just um, a small bump there, $2,000. Um, benefits, as I mentioned before, the big driver was on health insurance. Uh, and we talked about debt service and interfund transfers. Again, so the budget next year you know, tallies up to $116,921,215. Uh, 
another way that we're required to present the budget um, just this one time a year, we're not otherwise you know, reporting it, it's not in our accounting system, but is the three-part analysis, the component analysis, which looks at the administrative costs, the programmatic costs, and the capital costs for the district. So you can see on the table where we are in the current 22-23 year in those three domains, and then the proration of those costs relative to the whole, um, the whole budget, and then where we'll be for next year. So a $750,000 increase on administrative costs, just about a $6 million increase on programming costs, and a little over $1 million on capital. And you can see in that furthest right column that the, um, the share of those costs doesn't really change at all uh, for next year's proposed budget. So I wanted to show uh, where our spending increase is relative to Monroe 1 and um, Monroe 2 districts, so about the 20 or so districts. Uh, we come in kind of on the higher end here, uh, but again, that's reflective of uh, major programmatic investments that we're making. Um, the average for the county is definitely higher this year, kind of around 5.5%. Um, as we will talk about with revenue, that's primarily driven by the foundation aid and districts are making investments in program and trying to do some new and unique things. Um, so we're not alone in that. We have a bit of a higher budget this year, um, but certainly not the highest. Another um, you know, contextual piece of information is this is included in, in the um, budget packet that's available online. So this is the latest state financial transparency information showing that uh, the most recent year available, um, pupil expenditures on a per capita basis at Penfield uh, were about $17,600. The county average was closer to $19,000, and the statewide average was $23,000. Um, so trying to be efficient with uh, local resources. So just kind of a all up all in on proposed expenditures. Um, we are making those new investments in new program and staff. It's not a status quo budget. Uh, there are about 20, 21 new faculty positions, teaching positions uh, in next year's budget. Um, we're maintaining all other current staffing and programs, so there's no financial cuts or anything like that uh, contained within the budget. Uh, we're ensuring access to those most appropriate academic placements, even if it's not here at Penfield. Um, so if it has to be at BOCES, it has to be in another private ed setting. Um, we're ensuring that we're meeting those kiddos where, where they are. Uh, and those costs are increasing, but as we'll see as we pivot over to revenue, it's still a very fiscally sound budget plan. So that's where the money goes, Dr. Putnam. I um, appreciate that. Yeah. But more importantly, where does the money come from, Dr. Driffle? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. So uh, where does the money come from? Uh, that close to $117 million. So about 60% of our revenue comes from local funding by way of local property taxes. Uh, just two years ago, this was closer to 65 66%. Um, New York State education funding is now up to 36%. That was down around 32, 33%. County sales tax, again, which is a reminder, um, Monroe and Wayne County share their sales tax with us. Um, that makes up about 4%. All of the revenue, 1%, and then assigned fund balance um, is less than 1%. Assigned fund balance is money that we take from the current school year and apply it to next school year. Um, used to be called designated to reduce taxes, but now it's called assigned fund balance. So let's start um, kind of with the headline, um, the foundation aid increase that we're getting from the state. So uh, I'll put the caveat on here that when we adopted the budget back in April, we still didn't have a state budget. We still don't technically have a state budget, although they're printing bills today and doing approvals. It looks like it'll be done maybe this evening or tomorrow, kind of at the latest. Um, the good news is, is that the information today coming out of Albany is what we thought it was going to be back in April. So it's reflective of those executive budget numbers that um, Governor Hochul had put out back in January. So again, as a refresher, kind of that foundation aid, that's that big aid piece. Uh, this is the third full year of that phase-in formula. So we're expected to receive uh, $6.1 million more in that domain, or 31% year over year. Uh, UPK funding, um, we talked a lot about that back in February. That's a separate grant. It doesn't go to the general fund budget. Um, but on a per pupil basis, UPK funding hasn't increased. It doesn't look like it will. BOCES aid are the dollars that we get back from current year spending and BOCES aid in the, in the next year. Uh, I do think that'll be a bit higher. I've budgeted that to be a little bit higher. Uh, excess cost aid are the costs associated with high cost instruction, so both in public and private placements for special education um, students. 
instructional material aid, as a reminder, are those aids that we get on a one-to-one -one grant dollar basis from the state for textbooks, library materials, software, and uh, computer hardware. Uh, so a little over $500,000 there. Transportation aid projected to be uh, $4.5 million. I think that'll be a little bit less, just again, based on, um, you know, we still have two more months of spending in the current year. We continue to have empty bus driver positions. So they're basing that on our budget from the current year. We haven't spent our budget from the current year. So the reimbursement for next year will be a bit less, but that's accounted for in our budget. Uh, and building aid. So that's money that we get on prior capital projects. Our building aid ratio um, is around 80%. Um, so you can see that $7.7 .7 million more than uh, that $6.1 million in debt service that we had uh, looking at the expenses. So you can see at the bottom um, really that phase in of the foundation aid, uh, that kind of hockey stick uh, you know, graph. Um, it's been 15 years since the formula went into effect and now we're, we're technically fully funded um, as of next school year. So for 24, 25, we'll expect to go back to kind of a more, um, more historically normal funding level, probably something closer to what inflation is. We don't know exactly what that'll look like for next year, but I think it's safe to assume that these huge increases are, are probably, uh, this is probably the last of it. And with those big uh, increases in foundation aid, uh, this is the third year where the state has required us to put together a foundation aid plan and submit it to the state. Uh, for any districts receiving more than a 10% year over year increase in their foundation aid, we were at 30. Um, there is suggested areas of spending, but it's still not a mandate since foundation aid is, you know, it's unencumbered. It's left up to us to do with it what we see fit. Uh, there are seven suggested areas this year. Uh, there were five last year. Uh, we've identified four of the spending areas that our spending aligns to. So increasing graduation rates and eliminating the achievement gap, about a quarter of a million dollars there. That relates to alternative education and vocational education opportunities here at PHS. Reducing class sizes looks at our, um, our class sizes in common branch classes, specifically at the K-6. Uh, levels, um, so about $2.7 million in faculty salaries there. Addressing student social emotional help, so these are investments in those people, personnel services for next year, and then providing adequate resources to English language learners, students with disabilities, and students experiencing homelessness. Uh, most of that is tied up in the ICOT spending and some of the BOCES placements, uh, so about $2 million of the special ed costs, but there is also funding um, in this budget for English language learners, new ESSEL staff, uh, and specifically transportation for kiddos experiencing homelessness. Uh, we're required to solicit feedback on this report as we talked about at our, at our last meeting. Um, so if anybody has any feedback on this plan, um, it's encouraged and appreciated. Please reach out to my office at the number there by the end of May. Um, we're required to have the board adopt this. So we'll do that in June and then it has to be posted by the end of June. <coughs> So we'll talk a little bit about uh, local funding because um, that is our, our biggest revenue source. So this, as a reminder, is the property tax cap formula that went into effect back in 2011. Uh, I walked through every single step back in uh, February, so I'll kind of do that in a moment, but I won't walk it through it in total. Um, the point being is just a reminder every year that uh, for a long time, conversationally, it was known as a 2% tax cap when it's anything but. Um, so let's take a look at what the tax cap looked like this year for us. So you start with uh, the current year levy. So we're looking at lat next year, so it's the prior year levy. So this year, back in the fall of 22, uh, we levied $68.3 million in local property taxes. The state then gives you a number called the tax base growth factor, which accounts for new permitted growth in your locality. Uh, so you multiply that, uh, you add in any prior year pilots. So this year we have three pilot agreements um, providing $198,000. Pilots, as a reminder, are payments in lieu of taxes. Those are agreements that are made with the county for new industry. Um, so it's typically a tax break for new businesses. Uh, take any prior year exclusions, of which we did not have any. Uh, allowable growth factor is that 2% number that's tied to the CPI. So this year, the state is using an 8% CPI. That'll be listed on our budget notice in the newsletter that goes out um, later this week. But we can only utilize 2% there. So that's where the 2% cap comes from. Um, we add in any, or excuse me, subtract any pilots for the coming year. Uh, this current 
upcoming year, 23-24, we only have two pilots. One of the three pilots is aged out 10 years. Um, so we'll go down to two next year. That's why that's less. Uh, you add in any available carryover. Last year, we didn't levy up to our cap. So we had um, some of this mechanism, this carryover from last year that gets added into the equation to bring us to our local levy limit. Uh, and then you add in any coming year exclusions, again, none of which that we had to bring you to your maximum allowable levy of $71 million and change. So what this meant was that if we had any increase over 4.07% in this year's uh, proposed levy, we would have required more 60% uh, community approval. But as we've discussed over the last couple months, um, with the funding from uh, the state of New York, we're once again able to offer a 0% levy uh, in this budget. So uh, here's where that is reflected in kind of like our um, tax levy caps and our actual levies sort of in this tax cap era. Again, um, this 23-24 budget has $0 tax increase. Um, so come this fall, we won't levy a single dollar more than we did in the 22-23 year. And that's the second of the last three years that we've been able to do that. I should also note that since this legislation went into effect, we've always been at or underneath the cap, um, the tax cap. Again, providing context uh, across the county. Um, so Penfield this year is just one of three uh, districts that are um, moving forward with a zero levy for the community. And then one other uh, really small one. And then you can see everybody else is kind of more in that uh, uh, you know, one and a half to three percent <coughs> range. So that's uh, the extent of which um, we have control over what the, the tax collection process looks like. So we could levy up to a 4.07% increase uh, with just 50% approval. We've decided to move forward with a 0.0% increase. So that's that first step, determining the tax levy. Uh, and then we have to take into account the town assessments, the New York State equalization rates, and those spit out the calculation for what the tax rates are going to be. So I've shown this infographic a couple times. Um, so if anybody's new to it, essentially it's two towns. Uh, it's the exact same um, market value house in each town. We'll use Penfield and Brighton, for instance. In one town, the equalization rate is 74%. So the assessment on that house is only $185,000. But when the state comes in and says, well, you're 26% underassessed, it gets taxed at full market value of $250,000. Whereas the house in town B is assessed at $250,000. So the equalization rate matches the market value. Uh, and then you can see that the tax rates are different below. So in town A, where that uh, house is under assessed, the tax rate artificially gets enhanced up to that $27.03. Whereas in town B, uh, the tax rate is only $20. So uh, they pay the same school taxes in this scenario, even though one house is uh, valued at $185,000 through assessment and one is valued at $250,000 through assessment. We're the only sort of um, municipality in New York State that has to deal with the equalization rates because we cross town borders. When the town of Penfield does their um, levy, it's just the town of Penfield. There's nothing to you know, have to compare it to. So it's a measure of fairness and equity that the state puts in to ensure that all of our six towns are applied equally in the, the tax collection process. So we do expect more town equalization rates for next year. Um, so you can see what they actually were this year, Brighton at 89%. We recall Penfield did the reassessment last year, went up to 100%. Uh, Macedon also did a, a reevaluation last year, taking up to 100%. Everybody, again, through the hot housing market and increased housing values, is seeing a level of assessment uh, adjustment for next year. Uh, the big one is Brighton, going from 89% to 70%. And we'll see in a moment that ha that has an effect on their tax rate. Um, and then just showing below, you know, the makeup of what the um, what the taxable value is in land for for our school district. So about Four fifths Penfield, one tenth Brighton, um, and then Pittsford, Parrington, Masson, and Walworth make up kind of that rest of that 10%. So uh, it's our custom uh, at the budget hearing to put forward tax rate projections um, come fall when we have the tax collection process, but I want to put my Dan guarantee, my seal, that uh, this will change. Um, it should not change by too much, but it always changes every year based on um, our projections. So those town assessments aren't final until July. Those equalization rates aren't final from the state until July. 
Typically, the equalization rates don't change, but I have seen it. It does happen. Um, the board does not adopt the tax warrant until August, um, so this is not official. It's just a projection, and these are the numbers that will go forward in the prestige newsletter that goes to families this week. But you can see our current projection is um, Penfield's tax rate decreasing about 3.5%, Parrington increasing 2.3%, Pittsford increasing 10%, Brighton increasing 15.3%, Macedon decreasing 2.2%, uh, and the town of Walworth increasing 5.4%. Uh, the number that I kind of always try to look to is that true value tax rate. So that's reflective of what the tax rate would be if all six towns had that 100% um, equalization rate. Uh, and we would be 2094 this year, dropping down to 19.01 next year, which is a reduction of almost $2 per $1,000 of assessed value or a 9.22% decrease. And then just kind of showing where we've been historically with our true value or full value tax rate. Um, you can see kind of the big drop off in the last couple of years. We, for a long time, were sort of in that $24, $25 range. Uh, and then based on the two flat levies that we've had in the last three years and those soaring house values, pushed down the tax rate to um, what we project to be around 1901 for next year. And then again, just kind of like a county comparison where that true value tax rate would um, fall now um, amongst the 20 or so component districts in our county. So here is um, the full abridged kind of balanced budget. So by statute, New York State schools do need to put forward a, um, a balanced budget. So it's not like that in every state. Some can have deficit plans. Um, but you can see the current budget, the 109 million, 100,000 in the 22-23 columns, and then that 116 million, 900,000 um, budget in the 23-24 columns. We've kind of reviewed the expenses uh, and most of the revenue, but I do want to point out that the expected increase in county sales tax next year is projected to jump. Um, so even if you're factoring inflation being 8%, we're still 2% above that. So even in real terms, we're seeing um, strong sales receipts from um, our county partners. All other revenue is projected to increase about 9%. Um, that $150,000 right now is mostly in just interest earnings for money in our bank accounts as rates continue to rise. And that assigned fund balance that I mentioned earlier increases from $240,000 to a little over $400,000. Traditionally, Penfield has assigned around $2 million in fund balance. So we're still well below kind of um, that threshold. And then once again, not having to rely on any reserves or inner fund transfers as supplemental revenue this year, um, bringing us to our balanced proposed budget at $116,921,215. So uh, two weeks from today, Tuesday, May 16th, here at Penfield High School's West Gymnasium, we'll have the annual statewide vote and board election. Uh, polls are open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Absentee ballots are still available. Uh, you can reach out to our district clerk, Kathleen Zastro, if you require an absentee ballot. Um, voters must be at least 18 years old in residence for at least 30 days prior to the vote. Uh, this year on the ballot are the school operating budget that we just reviewed. Uh, we have a bus purchase proposition. Um, so we're seeking to buy nine buses purchased from our bus reserve. So that's not uh, any kind of budgetary um, uh, effect. So wh essentially what we're doing is just taking money out of our capital reserve, money that we've put aside over prior years to buy the buses. Um, as a reminder, in New York State, we get eight on the buses. Our aid ratio projected for next year is around 70%, 71%. Um, so every dollar that we spend of that $1.7 million aggregate aggregation for those nine buses, we get back 70 cents on the dollar. So we're looking to buy five large um, passenger buses in the diesel style, two large passenger buses that are electric that I'll discuss in a moment, and two um, mini bus gasoline buses for next year. And then we also have two three-year terms beginning July 1st, 2023 for our Board of Education um, seats. So that bus uh, purchase proposition, if you're not aware, there's currently a New York State mandate that all new, new school buses must be zero emission, um, new, newly purchased in 2027, and the full fleet must be electrified by 2035. Uh, last year, working with our assembly member Lunsford, uh, Penfield School District received a New York State grant for $250,000 to purchase electric school buses. 
So as a part of this proposition this year, we're seeking to buy two electric buses. Uh, those two buses will have zero cost to the local community. They'll be fully covered by the 70% aid that we get from the state and then this additional $250,000 grant. And that also includes the charging infrastructure that we have to install um, to make sure that those can be powered up. The other buses, as I mentioned, all receive the 70% aid, but uh, the local cost for buses is typically around that 30% level. Uh, and with that, Dr. Putnam and Lisa, I turn it back over to you. I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you. You're that welcome. was wonderful. Um, this now um, opens the public comment period of this hearing. So if anyone has any questions or comments about the budget specifically that was presented, um, they can do so at this time. You can come up to the table and just state your name and state your comment or questions. I think there's no comment or questions this evening. So we'll just conclude um, the hearing. We just want to um, thank everyone for their continued support during the pandemic. Um, and really, we were so excited to welcome families back to a little bit of normalcy this year. So that's been really great. Um, just to highlight a little bit of what Dan went over, um, the 23-24 budget proposal is a little bit over $116.9 million. This represents a 7% increase over last year's budget, which includes additional teachers for the ICOP model as explained, teachers also for music business and psychology and English language learners and assistant principals at each elementary level. Despite these increases, we're able to keep the proposed level increase at 0%, so that means there's no change to the tax dollars. This is the second time we've been able to do this in three years. There's also a, um, a proposition to purchase nine buses. This also has no tax implication based on um, that is coming from our school capital bus reserve fund. Finally, there will be three candidates for two open board seats at the election vote. These will all be three-year terms. Please remember to vote between 6 and 9 p.m. on Tuesday, May 16th at the high school gym. And thank you for being here. And this concludes our annual budget hearing. But we're not done because we got to go back to the regular meeting. <laughs> but wait, there's more. All right, so now we're at number five board members on your agenda. May I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves the consent agenda as listed? So moved. Second. Questions or comments on that? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. And that brings, oh, that brings us to special reports already, right? Back to you, special reports. Are we there? Okay. We're there. We have, um, thank you, Dr. Griffith. We have one special report this evening. Um, it's a textbook presentation, and so I will ask Mr. McMillan from the PHS English Department to come on up. Yeah. <laughs> you can sit at the table. The microphone works. I am happy. I think you have three slides, if my understanding. There's one for each uh, book. Yes. But yep. So she was nice enough to make those. And there's a clicker there if you want to click through. Okay. Um, right over to the other side. Oh, there you go. And I have learned, make sure it's on. Okay. I forget. <laughs> um, so I've never presented at a board meeting before, so if I talk too much, shut me up. And if not enough, if, if you have more questions, let me know. Um, the nice piece is presenting after the budget hearing. I don't think you have to worry right. about talking too much. <laughs> I just talked a whole lot, so you can talk as much as you want. I appreciate Should I it. warn the board members that when um, Mr. McMillan talks about books, you are going to want to run right out <laughs> and, and book. get the books <laughs> and read them? Mr. McMillan is... <sighs> You do such a great, I'm so excited that you're here tonight. Thank so you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, for those of you that I've never met, my name is Drew McMillan. Uh, this is my eighth year in Penfield and my 18th year teaching English. Um, this year, our uh, department chair, Lisa Henry, is retiring, and I'll be taking over the AP, the AP literature course. And we're trying to infuse new, new uh, titles in all of our courses, um, including AP. Um, in, in general, we're, we're looking to, we, we call it uh, windows, not mirrors. We're, we're trying to add diverse voices. You know, this is, this is not a terribly diverse district. Um, and our reading list has been far less diverse than I think we've wanted it to be over the years. Um, 
And so we, we've been slowly adding um, minority voices, female voices, queer voices. Um, and so we have three books that we are looking to add um, for, a, for AP uh, that are also high interest. Um, and with, with the AP course, obviously, it's, it can't just be high interest. It has to also be very high rigor. Um, so while we're updating the curriculum, we are looking for um, challenging texts for, for these kids that have chosen to challenge themselves. So the three books that, uh, that we're bringing, um, The Candy House and uh, They're There and Station Eleven are all, um, they're similar in that they're all fragmented and have multiple narrators. Um, they time hop and, and they all uh, ask, I, I don't know that they answer, which I think is important, but they ask very Im important questions about current issues. Um, so two of them are written by women. Um, Emily St. John Mandel and uh, Jennifer Egan, and then Tommy Orange is a Native American man who wrote there, there. Um, so I guess, should I kind of go through like each book quickly individually? Is that yeah, kind of how it works? Yeah, you actually have okay. a slide for each book. I do. Yeah. Or actually, right Sheena made it. I didn't, I, I don't want to take credit. I can help you. So oh, the first one. Okay. There so the know. Candy House is uh, a relatively new book, um, and I actually just read it like a few months ago. Um, it is asking a lot of questions about social media, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, um, and our, I guess our, the fact that we're so enamored with it, but also maybe often race to embrace it before we consider the dire consequences and how it changes really everything. Um, and it, this book is, spans uh, a few generations, including the um, inventor of this like new company that basically encapsulates your memory and lets it become public and so you can access memories of everyone else that has bought into this um, which is creepy yeah. <laughs> uh, but also fascinating um, but and you know it and it, it investigates the individual and the global implications of that uh, through the kind of the the family line of the people who created it and how it's like sort of plagued them all along um, and I, I think it's, it's very challenging. Uh, we've all read it in my department. It, it sort of like blew through the department earlier this year. Um, I know Lisa Henry um, piloted with a couple of students. She got a, her hands on a couple copies and was like, who wants to check this out? And the kids just like could not read it fast enough. They loved it. Um, and so I think, and it, it's, all three of these books are award uh, finalists. So they're, they're not just like pulp, you know, they're, um, I think books that will be relevant for many years. Um, so the next one is, you might have to do it for me, sorry. Uh, there There is, uh, again, it's told through several narrators um, and it's uh, a, a collection of young Native American people <coughs> living in and around Oakland who are sort of um, all eventually going to uh, converge on a big powwow at the Oakland Coliseum um, through quite a bit of, uh, I guess, meditation uh, in the writing. There, there is a lot of um, like real reflection on what it means to be an, a Native American today in, in an urban setting, uh, whether you're super connected to the culture or not. And I think that's, that's a, uh, a type of voice that we don't get a lot of in our, in our reading curriculum. Um, and I think it's a really powerful uh, window into looking at, um, you know, people dealing with, uh, struggling with their identity, struggling with poverty, struggling with um, not seeing a lot of opportunity um, in, their, in their future, and, but also having this, like, intense desire to find out about their history and, you know, what, what it can mean to them today. Um, and then the final book uh, by Emily St. John Mandel is called Station Eleven. This is the probably most one that maybe you would have heard of it that they made it into a TV show. Um, it's a, a, a bit on the nose. It's about a world pandemic that wipes out the vast majority of the population. Um, so I think now that we're perhaps a little bit past the trauma, of, you know, the instant trauma of uh, COVID, um, it, it really could help us reflect on the, like what comes after 
um, especially when you know the world has been fundamentally changed. I mean, there there are no systems, no uh, no infrastructure in, in place in the world of this book, and the the really the only thing that endures is a celebration of the arts. There's like this traveling troupe that is trying to put on Shakespeare plays, um, and Station Eleven is actually a comic book that someone had given the protagonist before the book started, and she sort of carries it with her, and so that's. Um, the the talisman that sort of that like all the different stories branch out of so um, again all three of these books I think are are challenging uh, they're beautiful and I think that they would invite uh, a lot of important and powerful conversations with our students so I think Sheena brought you guys copies or the copies she yep. did and I left them in okay. my office so I just as long as it wasn't my job to bring them that's all <laughs> It wasn't, it was mine. Okay. <laughs> so, Drew, can I ask you a question yeah, while you're here? Can please. I shift from the fact that I forgot the books? Um, <laughs> will you remind us all, um, AP allows you to choose the text that for the course, correct? They, they give us a broad reading list, which they are updating kind of every year. And in the last couple of years, they've like put out a... A, a new sort of like here are all the new books that kids could should be reading um, that's about all I can speak to I'm getting trained this summer to teach it mm -hmm. and Lisa's always taught it since I've been here so mm -hmm. I'm actually really excited to kind of dive into the curriculum but yes they th they are providing us with su like suggestions yeah. and these three books were on that list yes So before we uh, turn, I know um, there's going to be questions. Prepare yourself. Um, <laughs> but it goes with the books. I think it's a good reminder that the books are on um, display, both at the district office and the public library. And they'll stay on display until the next board meeting. And this is for all books, textbooks, and, and books that get approved by the board. Um, and so if people have comments, they can write comments down. And then we share those at the next meeting before the board uh, makes a decision one way or the other. There won't, Leslie there won't forgot be any, the books. There won't be any scary there. questions. Oh, that's okay. Questions, board members? Oh, look, there's lots of questions. Oh, Lila has a question. I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> um, so it's not really a question, but I just wanted to say I have Mrs. Henry this year for AP Literature, and um, one of the books that we read in my small group was The Candy House, and I just want to say it was probably one of probably top 10, I don't think it'd be quite top five, but definitely top 10 of my favorite books I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And really just the, all the themes are really interconnected. And Mr. Mack mentioned there's, you know, the different points of views that are connected and you don't see things immediately when you're reading it the first time. I went back and I skimmed some chapters and it's really a book that opens a lot of discussion because there's the obvious themes about technology and the impact it has, but then also like, famili like familiar life and how, you know, your roles with your family change over time and how technology impacts that. And I think it's really relevant, especially when you're thinking about, oh, this is senior year, you're thinking about your future, you're starting to make decisions, and you have to think about things from different perspectives. And I think this book um, was really something, you know, that opened my eyes to a lot of different things. So I definitely was talking to Mrs. Henry, and I think this should definitely be a book in the curriculum. Um, and also, I just have a point about the um, list of recommended books for the AP. So for the exam, um, the final essay question, they give you a theme, and then you can use any book of a high rigor to answer that question with specific examples. And I think this book would definitely have a lot of themes that would be you know, pretty easy to provide examples for a multitude of themes that they ask you about. That's great. Thank you, Lila. That was very yeah, insightful. Mm -hmm. Mark, did you have a question? I did. Uh, you know, you mentioned, that you kind of alluded that these are fairly new books, mm -hmm. new ads, and you mentioned about awards. Can you speak a little more to the awards that, if you know what they are specifically, and, and what that, you know, what kind of, what does that award mean in terms of the caliber of the book? Uh, um, so they were, two of them were National Book Award finalists, and one was a Pulitzer finalist. Um, so I don't, none of them won the award, but, you know, there's, there's, uh, I want to say six five six every year that 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 mm -hmm. make that list um so i i think that just speaks to their their caliber and their their acclaim not just by like people buying them but by critics and you know, professors perhaps or um people in the literary world uh, recognizing their relevance and 
uh, ability to to connect you know across the page to the reader great thank you thank you uh nicole oh sorry I, I couldn't I, there were so many questions i got <laughs> i got confused well i'm excited for the ap kids but i'm 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 jealous of for the other kids who might not be in a in 12th grade ap english so are are there plans to add these books to the the regular curriculum or or add other new books of diverse voices or uh for like all all seniors or just for the whole school the whole high school yeah so we, we we've been trying to slowly add diver diverse voices for I, really since i got here mm -hmm. um we we're teaching tanahasi coates now we're teaching um oh my god the hate you give mm -hmm. um and, and so for these particular books um we wouldn't bring them into other like junior or sophomore courses because then we would not want those kids to read the book twice <laughs> um yeah. but uh we have a, like a sci-fi and fantasy lit uh elective for seniors which i think station 11 would 100 percent be relevant for mm -hmm. um but yes, to, to answer your initial question, we are 100% every year looking for high interest, but also high rigor and also diverse voices in, in every, every course that we are adding books to. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, Mrs. Watt is, um, she has taken the textbook, what we've done in the past has always been a textbook um, proposal process and she has kind of shifted that kind of taken it and spun it a little bit um and she has a committee of students faculty administrators i can't remember if there's parents i i think so i think so too um and they're looking at text i believe not solely for english um is this the one that charlie is heading yes up? okay yeah. yes and um we're looking to develop a new process in terms of ensuring that their books, not only are they um, diverse texts, but also getting feedback from students, families prior to the adoption process. So she's really, I guess, a summary would be piloting a new adoption process. Thank you. You had Kristen. Have I don't a have a question. I just have a comment. I think it's really awesome that you're finding books that are relevant to the kids because I think I know, as a, I'm an elementary teacher and my boys are not lovers of reading, which drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that it's relevant to them. I think that's what hooks kids. And I love that there's representation and I love that they're able to make connections because I think so, that's what hooks kids as readers. So thank you for all the work that you're doing to make it. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Mack. Hi. Um, this is amazing. This is wonderful. Like what Kristen said, the relevance of what our children are reading and actually having maybe some personal knowledge, personal experience with some of these stories where they can see themselves in it or maybe they know someone like this. And so just hearing different voices, reading different stories, and being given information where you can build your own critical thinking, right? Not being told what to think, but being given information through books, through conversation, through experience, like, hey, what do you think about this? Let's, let's talk about it. So thank you for all of the work that you're doing. I really appreciate it. Yeah. That brings a thought to mind. Um, it's not just what they're interested in, it's also what they're going to be facing. And um, today I was watching, I was watching the news and there's uh, a writer's strike going on right now in Hollywood. And one of the sticking points that the writers wanted reassurance on was that the studios wouldn't do, wouldn't be using AI to replace the writers and the studios wouldn't guarantee that. So we're embarking on a whole, uh, it's a whole new world. So I think it's really good to be thinking about it, reading about it, um, addressing it. So, yeah. And ditto to what everybody else said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah but it's, it's, a, yeah. it's quite the time it's we're great. living in. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much for coming. I, I, I agree with Dr. Maloney, because now I'm writing down all the books that mm -hmm. I have to read. And then I get this big stack next to my bed. So I appreciate it. I thank would, you I so would much. I just share before you leave that Station Eleven has caused a lot of drama between Dr. Kenny and I, because oh. Dr. Kenny read the book, and I only watched the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> the TV show is so actually, I mean, it's not like the book. The book's That's better. what Dr. Kenny tells me. He but tells me I am missing out, and so I did write it down again. You were a good reminder that I did, did do need to read that this summer. So the, the show is Kenny pretty good, though. Discuss. The show is really good. But I think, again, that high interest piece is really important, and I always think of the fact that when we talk about classics, um, you know, we all think back to whenever we were in high school and what was read. And there have been many, many years with many, many authors and lots of work. So the classics are, will always be classics, but it doesn't mean we should not be adding new books yeah. and looking at, what, you know, you mentioned they'll be around for a long time, you know, looking at what are the new classics and, and how do they fit into our curriculum to really prepare students for that AP exam. Lila did a great job. I was ready to jump in, but she did a better job <laughs> talking about how that question, you can use any uh, text of rigor and and it's really um, amazing to, to push our kids in to be thinking deeply so thank you so much for everything and, and I'm looking forward to it thank you guys for having me thank, thank you, you Drew thank you. that can conclude special reports all right that was fun all right so we're up with a student Rep report, Lila, hello. Hi, um, so starting off with updates here at PHS. Um, the Jazz fundraiser was this past weekend featuring Gabe Cordon. Um, last Friday was also the NHS blood drive and this was um, a great success. We had a, bi a big mix of both school and community members donating. Um, yesterday was May 1st and it was decision day for our seniors. So members of the class of 2023 were encouraged to wear items showing their post-graduation plans, whether it's college, workforce, trade school, or gap year. So that was really cool being able to see all, you know, my classmates, some of them I've known since kindergarten, you know, seeing where we're all going to be in the next couple of years. So um, AP Biology went on a field trip to Linear Park and Tinker Park to learn about ecosystems. The junior prom was last weekend and senior ball is next Saturday night at Casa Larga. And also NHS will be sponsoring an ice cream social with all pro proceeds benefiting the National Alliance for Mental Illness. Vouchers can be purchased in advance through NHS members and will also be sold at the event on May 16th starting at 630. And this is occurring during the boys lacrosse senior night. At Bay Trail, the annual shopping cart challenge um, finished up a couple weeks ago, and this is where all three grades compete against each other to see who can bring in the most donations for the Penfield Ecumenical Food Shelf. And sixth grade won, and as a result, they were all able to duct tape their administrators to the wall. <laughs> um, at Scribner, fourth and fifth graders have been hard at work preparing for their concert next Monday. At Harris Hill, they, a second grader was recognized for displaying respect and was acknowledged as the top hound. At Indian Landing, kindergartners have been working hard to learn how to sound out more complicated words when reading. And at Cobbles, their arts festival is next <coughs> Wednesday. And many Cobbles students help bring in flowers to recognize their teaching assistants. Thank you. Thank you, Lila. Would you like to share your decision with us? Um, yeah, so I'm going to be attending UPenn next year. Awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yay. Other questions or comments for Lila? Just not to forget us little people. No, <laughs> you have to visit. Never. It's important. Back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. All righty. Now we're on number, where are we? Oh, number six, superintendent reports. All right. It's your turn. Thanks. So uh, yeah, we just have a few um, student uh, superintendent reports. I uh, just have a few staff and um, student honors. Quick update and then um, a business update from Dr. Driffle. And so just some, some great things. Young Women of Distinction, congratulations to PHS senior Patrice Reichman on being named a finalist for the Young Women of Distinction Award by the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce Women's Council. It really is incredible to be a finalist um, um, for this award. The oratorical competition, thank you very much to our, our Rotary, our local Rotary that holds this competition and congratulations to juniors Anna Freeman and Grace Macbeth uh, uh, who were named award winners in our local Rotary competition. 
Um, a little bit of all greater Rochester winter teams and kudos to all of our athletes. Uh, congratulations to the following PHS students who were named to the all greater Rochester teams for the winter season. So for girls bowling, Jackie Funk made the first team and Grace Alexander the second team. Girls bowling, sorry, that was girls basketball for Jackie Funk and Grace Alexander. Girls bowling, two very different sports. <laughs> Tiffany McCarthy in the second team and boys track and field, Peter Northrup uh, first team. And then honorable mentions are there with Aiden Cook and Antonio Medina, Jackson Fixon, uh, Sean Walsh, Kiernan <coughs> McGee, and uh, Emmy Moore. And so just again, kudos to all of our um, athletes and student athletes here. Uh, as mentioned during our, our budget um, hearing, uh, once again, Penfield has been named uh, Best Community for Music Education for 2023. Um, obviously, uh, I always talk about this is that when we talk about students when it comes to um, artistic talent, um, I, I make the mistake sometimes for saying their, their talent, but it really is hard work and dedication and uh, staying the course. And thank you to all of our incredible uh, music teachers because that starts way down in elementary school all the way through um, high school and beyond. And, and I'm sure lots of parents who, like myself, had to listen to um, the hot dog Suzuki song for a long time, but, <laughs> but they yes. get there. So a lot of work. Congratulations. And then National Teacher Appreciation Week, and just like to take a moment uh, to take this opportunity to give special thanks to our teachers for their dedication and hard work. Our teachers in Penfield continue to be committed to providing a rich and successful learning experience for all students, and we are incredibly proud of Team Penfield, and thank you for all of your efforts on behalf of our students. And so I'm just going to tell you a little that even at the superintendent level, sometimes there's drama because some people are celebrating Teacher Appreciation Week this week because it's listed two different ways, but we went with um, the majority, which is uh, celebrating next week. So if you do have anybody say Happy Teacher Week this week, they're not wrong, um, but um, uh, really it's a focus on on, on next week but we should be celebrating and talking teacher appreciation every single day of the school year That's and the sure. summer uh, school lunch hero day lots of celebrations in may we just like to recognize our food service staff who prepare healthy meals for our students every day and serve all of our students with a smile they truly are behind the scenes heroes who make sure our students are well fed and ready to learn so just thank you so much for our school lunch may 5th is school lunch hero day um, and just very, uh, uh, very happy for all of what we're able to do in terms of how many students go through that line uh, and, and getting both lunches and a la carte items. And uh, they, they just, bring, um, just bring so much uh, energy to that position. And School Nurse Day, May 10th, uh, we would like to celebrate and recognize contributions of our school nurses. We can't thank them enough for everything they do to ensure the health and safety of our students and staff. Um, they are truly appreciated today and every day. I, I still um, look at what our school nurses stepped into during a pandemic and what they were asked to do and what they, uh, their whole world changed like everybody's, but as a school nurse, it, it is different. And um, they have been absolutely amazing. And I know, I hope they feel a little bit, you know, with not having to worry about COVID testing and, and all the protocols that were put on place in schools across New York State. So kudos to all of our school nurses. Um, questions on any of the staff and student honors? For members questions? No, just a couple comments if yeah. I may. First for the oratorical or the, yes. yeah. Have I ever, say that word wrong every time. Oh, so you know, so was it? Whatever, so. whatever the word is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've attended that before. I didn't yeah. attend this year's, but that is an amazing, yeah. it is amazing to watch high school students. It's a, I don't know, is it four minutes, five minutes, yeah. whatever it is that they take a topic, they research it, and they, I think it's a position that they take. And it's then connected to the rotary four yes. point test. Yes, that's right. So it's connected right. back to the, the sort of the overview theme of rotary. That's yeah. right, yes, and, and that's a, um, it's a good distinction to make, but they take one of them and then they, um, they explain how they understand it and they stand in front of a whole group of people not necessarily behind a lectern mm -hmm. or anything. They just stand there and then they explain and, and talk to the group. And it's an amazing thing. So every time I hear about that or when I am able to see it, yeah. I'm really very blown away by it. Yeah. 
And then um, the other comment I wanted to make is when you talk about the nurses and the teachers and the <coughs> food service people, at the same time we're talking about coming out of the pandemic, I realize we've been through a lot, mm -hmm. you know, together. Yep. And there's been a lot of people who really lifted us up and carried on. And when you stop and think about it, um, you kind of have to stop your head from spinning a little bit because there has been so much. Yep. And people have been amazing. So I needed to say that. So that was my comment. Thank you. That was a lovely comment. Well, thank you. I agree. <laughs> so I just said, oh. I do have. Oh, I sorry. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I have had the privilege the last two weeks to visit buildings and with um, Mr. George in English and who's a brilliant human. And I'm so glad that he is part of our district. Anyway, um, but I had the opportunity to speak to one of the Bay Trail nurses and I, I seeked her out specifically because she has been wonderful with caring for my children. Um, and I just wanted to let her know that she has a new kiddo in the building, so good luck. Um, <laughs> but I asked her, I'm like, so what are you seeing now, now that COVID has not disappeared, but has calmed down, or coming back to a little bit more of normalcy. I said, but what's, what's going on, you know? She's like, oh, you know, we're seeing a lot of Monday-itis. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Friday wiggles. I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, all right. She says, but apart from that, it's been okay. Yeah. You know, it's been okay. So, yes, COVID may be calming down, but there's still stuff happening in the nurse's office. A hundred percent. And we, I like to call those things the pre-COVID concerns, which yeah. I love. Like, I'll take yeah. Monday-itis yeah, yeah, yeah. and Friday wiggles <laughs> right. all day long. And she had this brilliant <laughs> smile on her face. Yeah. You know, like, she yeah. was all for it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. a, it's an amazing, so. amazing role they have in terms of really knowing our, knowing our students and being right. able to support in so right, many right. ways. Yeah. That's so great. I just, I have to share that. It was, it was a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Can I click now? No, no, I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so just, I just have one update slide, which is really, we talked at the last meeting about the Penfield Education Foundation. So just uh, thank you to the community. The, I know that um, it was such a great day um, to come out and really support the foundation, which is not the district, um, but I sit on the foundation as their bylaws, as sort of a, the, the district rep. But every single dollar earned goes to student scholarships and some to teacher grants, but it's really that student scholarship piece. And just... Um, having people come out the weather was 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 good um, and so just thank you uh, for board members that came out and community members dr. Driffle ran um, you know we had a lot of people out there um, um, really uh, supporting and uh, um, and I ate donuts so it was great yeah. so again kudos and more information will come out once we from the foundation but they're gearing up for student scholarships yes I just want to know who won the highest participation rate I know it wasn't the board just saying all right. I'm a little so I am. All right. It hasn't Next been. Next year there better be 100% participation. I will tell but you that that um, I haven't actually made the announcement. I'll make it oh. right now. Oh, then no, don't, we're no, good. No, no, that's I'm, okay. I'm happy to no. tell you, in terms of percentages, district office won. Oh, no. Really? But a trophy and bragging rights come to that, and because we are here for the kids, the trophy <laughs> will be delivered and bragging rights oh, go to Cobbles Elementary School as having the most staff participation on that. So, so I figured with, with DO we can live without the trophy, um, but we'll keep bragging rights. Um, but yeah, so it was this year was Cobbles, and it's a great question because it, it had been Harris Hill for many years, but, mm -hmm. but Cobbles came out in force for staff. So yeah bragging rights are really important for for folks and so um, right. we, we will be doing that <coughs> I'll get that email out to everybody tonight so so uh, but I, I know everybody's watching the board meeting so they'll, they'll know. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. um, yeah it's a great question but again just a, a great turnout in terms of people coming out and and donating and just great um, you know um, um, organizations and partnerships with folks um, I'll just add that um, the premier sponsor was Family First Credit Union that does a lot with us in partnership. Um, you'll, you'll see them again in June for our arts and education um, celebration and they present that and um, 
Uh, we've talked about sometimes here, one of the Monroe County School Board and Superintendent organizations is ACT for public education, and they do a lot of work with school districts just to try to celebrate the, pub the public education. One of the things ACT is doing is honoring um, organizations, businesses within the school communities that, that work in partnership with schools. And so this year, Penfield, um, um, uh, submitted uh, Family First. And so that will be uh, celebrated this Friday um, at a breakfast. And um, I and Nancy Bradstreet will be sitting with the CEO of Family First just to say, you know, thank you uh, for the work they do in partnering with, with students and, and giving back. So again, go back to that goal of partnerships, one of the board's, mm -hmm. board's co um, core goals and, and Family First just wanting to support our, our students. And um, they were great with the foundation and the support they gave uh, financially for, for kids. I said it was just one slide, but I really took a long time on that one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to skip questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to <laughs> Dr. Driffle has, has just, uh, I believe, an update. Yeah, ju just a quick update. Um, very excited to officially share that the State of Education or the State Education Department Office of Facilities Planning uh, has approved the plans for our new um, transportation and buildings and ground facility. Uh, so it was with them for six or seven months, um, mm. but we, we at least got that step done. Um, so that work is now out to bid. We anticipate opening bids soon, and we'll hopefully have contractor awards to bring back to the, the Board of Education at our next meeting on the 23rd. Uh, at that point, um, hopefully we'll be able to mobilize those contractors and break ground shortly thereafter. And get rolling so it's really exciting that's very exciting yeah so we don't have our other phases in yet correct they're not so we submitted for phase 2a which is kind of like a very small portion of Harris Hill Bay Trail and Scribner um, we have not submitted phase 2b which is kind of the major work here okay. at PHS gotcha. yep design for that work is still ongoing the, yeah that's what yeah. I thought perfect that's it for me. Any Ooh. questions? You're not going to talk about the budget again? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I asked two questions during the hearing, and I got an answer to both of them. So right. where that does the money come from, and where does the money go? That, that so. was very good. Very no, I appreciate answers. it. Other <laughs> questions <laughs> for Dan? <laughs> Any other questions for Dan? No. No, right. kudos, Dan. Thank you. Yes, that's exciting. That, that's a big deal. Good news. It is good news. Yeah. Uh, that concludes superintendent reports. All right. Thank you. Right, so that brings us to item seven, our public comment period. We do not have any speakers signed up um, for this evening. As a reminder, um, instructions to participate in public comment are listed in the agenda and available online. Individuals who choose to participate in the public comment period are in the pub. <laughs> Should I try that again? In the public, see, this is why I shouldn't have had coffee at 2.30. I have to talk slower. In the public comment period should note that they agreed to and are bound by the terms outlined in policy 1515. In order to protect individual rights, comments that are personal in nature should be brought to the attention of the board president or their superintendent privately or in writing. Generally, the board does not respond to items presented by or questions raised by speakers during public comment and individuals should um, follow the code of conduct. So we are moving on to, oh, we now have no facilities or financial items. Oh my goodness, you guys. We're moving right along here. Uh, we're on number item 10, president remarks or presentations. We had one Monroe County School Board Committee meeting that I attended the information exchange meeting on April 19th. Um, this meeting was um, a panel discussion that I was a part of that really just talked about um, functional boards and Amy Thomas just asked questions of myself the president of BOCES 2 was there um, Gary from Spencerport mm -hmm. was there and the VP from HFL and I'm forgetting her name um, so it was nice it was recorded <coughs> if anybody wants to go back I got to I was asked about you know good relationship with this superintendent so I got to say oh my superintendent's not here I can say whatever I want <laughs> So maybe you want to go see the recording. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it was. I think it went well. Amy asked just some general questions about board functioning, and um, so if you you can go and listen if you'd like. Yeah. Questions on that? Thanks for doing that. 
was fine. It was fun. Um, so we'll move on to district committee meetings. Um, we had a code of conduct meeting on April, I should put my glasses on, 20th. Uh, myself was there and Nicole was there. Yes. Do you want to comment, Nicole? You. Me? I'll comment. I know last time we were like, what did we talk about? So this time we broke back into groups, right? Mm -hmm and we talked about our different sections is that what we did or did we do that the last time now see it starts to all run together our tears for behavior oh that's what we talked so about the ways in which this draft is going to support our faculty mm -hmm. our classroom staff um, how we would think about what some of the examples for behavior are and we also talked about responses and interventions at different tiers for behavior that we want to explore. So we spent some time reviewing that. And that's just one section of many sections of the right. Code of Conduct. We highlighted the policies that we have um, been drafting and the other sections that we've been drafting. And we are finalizing some of the other parts of the draft and we look forward to presenting it to the community for public comment. Right. So can you please share, because um, I don't remember all the, I think it's interesting that I love the Code of Conduct meeting that we have because we have board representation and teachers and administrators and students, but yes. you guys are also, mm -hmm. with the Children's Institute, conducting all these um, different Accordion sessions. Right. Yes. Can you so talk actually, a little bit about I would that? like to engage Lila because Lila was a part of a student accordion yeah. session that we met with last week. Um, spent some time this morning at Bay Trail with students as well. And so Lila, what were your thoughts about the draft code of conduct? Um, yeah, so it was, we went over it during our DEI committee, I think it was last week, yes. right? And it was really interesting to see the way it's laid out and also the way that it's very clear, the different responses. And I think um, the update was something that you know, needed to happen. And I, there was also an additional part about technology um, that I think, you know, discussed a lot of debate because there's a lot of things about, you know, with newer technology, obviously, like a big one was discussion about AirPods and how that fits into, you know, the curriculum and how that impacts, you know, learning and also students. But I think, you know, it was great to hear from, you know, peers, others, students that are in like freshmen, sophomore, all the way through seniors. So it was great to be able to discuss. Um, I worked with another senior and Mrs. Sick to talk about it. So it was cool to see it from different perspectives. Um, but I mean, obviously it was still a draft, but I mean, all of our comments were pretty positive. So it'll be interesting right. and good to see it next year roll out. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the benefits, Lila, um, and I know that the group also um, acknowledged the way that your peers were integral in developing mm -hmm. two policies in particular. So one of them was dress code mm -hmm. and the other one was the e electronic use. Mm -hmm. And so even thinking about the dress code and the ways in which your peers have helped to develop some of the mm -hmm. language that's going into the code, it really represents the student voice that we wanted to make sure that we were capturing. Um, so we're, we're well on our way. We are heading into our 10th month um, engaging all of our stakeholders as part of our large group and we continue to have conversation with other stakeholder groups and tomorrow is going to be a conversation with athletics and um, extracurricular clubs to just kind of get their feedback around the code as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And then we did reschedule the community conversation for, for Monday, week, May right? 8th, yes, mm -hmm. here in PHS Commons. Um, and we will hold that from 6 to 7.30. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That Monday? Monday, because that, that was when the power went out for yeah, that. Right, yeah, right, right. right. Okay. So any questions or comments on, on that meeting? No? Okay. And then we have the DEI core committee meeting. Uh, Krista or Kristen, would you like to speak to that? Okay, I guess I'm speaking and you can add. Uh, so we met last night um, and basically we just went through um, a review of what our subcommittees have been. And then our um, high school, our middle school and one of our elementary schools just shared out what they're doing. Uh, I think the big thing that really we walked away from was that next year we're really digging in deeper with our building level teams because that's kind of where our DEI lives. Mm -hmm. um, really excited to have that five year long or the, our long range plan. That's where it, I think it kind of lives and breathes and the principals are really excited to kind of have that as 
um, their reference point as they're moving forward and planning. And I think the biggest thing that came out of this meeting is we have a lot of people that are really committed to this process. Um, I think our district team for all really digging in. And I think, I think Krista mentioned this last night, like we often wanna go fast and get things done quicker, but really I think we're realizing that we're being very thoughtful in the processes that we're taking and we really have that long range plan. It's really the slow and steady kind of piece you know, doing it one piece at a time and making sure really um, we're hitting every piece of it. We're coming in from that, that lens of equity everywhere we go. So really excited to what's come. We've done a lot of work still, and we know that we'll always have work to do. It doesn't end, but it's always ongoing, but. Thank you. So, do you want to add anything? No, no. you nailed it. Yeah. No. Anything to add? No. no. Questions or comments on that? No. All right. Okay, so I don't think we have any unfinished business. Do we have any new business? We have. I just want to point out everyone should have received the email about the Monroe County School Board Association annual meeting. Oh, yes. Which is the, I had it right here, the 24th. 24th. Um, so just please sign up. I uh, don't want to be there alone. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, and just maybe, Margaret, I know, is like for newer board members, too, that one is, is open to all board members Correct. from every school. So um, typically uh, the superintendent and the board president uh, attends a monthly meeting of Monroe County School Boards, but that one is where they do some honors and celebrations um, um, for people. So ev everybody is, uh, mm -hmm. if you're interested, make sure you... Um, well, and it's speak. also the annual business meeting, too, where they select officers. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's more focused on dessert, but that is also, is <laughs> also that's important. Well, they usually have like a student yeah. group performing, which is yes, really cool. The, usually the host. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. host district yeah. will which have is, a, which is kind of nice. Music group. Yeah. Music, right. Student music, yes. Yeah, that's fun. Okay. Thanks so for, it's, thank at least you. It's in, Raj, it's in Roe Ave, so it's not on the other side of the county. Right, time. right. Yep. Nice. Thank you. Anything else that I missed? No. All right. Well, then may I please have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting at 7.59 p.m. So, second. <laughs> Questions or comments on that? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.